What do you think? I think we're dead meat. Real dead meat. You're dead meat! Go ahead and laugh, you guys. The final final little pass is a business. A dead meat. Welcome to the Dead Meat Podcast, your horror safe haven. I'm Chelsea. And I'm James. And we're engaged and we like to get scared together. Yeah, we're st- still working on the new intro. <laughs> so this week we are talking about Candyman. 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 Candyman? Guess- you say it a sixth time, does it cancel? Right, it starts over, it just cancels it out. It's like uh, cornhole rules, it goes back down. If you go oh, over corn, 21, yes. it subtracts the points. The game everyone plays. Also known as bags. Listen, if you're from the Midwest and you have drunk uncles, you've played cornhole. Yeah. I think. Pro tip, don't leave your cornhole bags outside where they can get wet. Don't get your cornhole wet. Don't get your cornhole wet. It got real moldy and buggy. Yes, they did. Looking like oogie boogies. And fucking... I stuck my hand in the cornhole bag. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. All right. Speaking of bugs, it's bugs and 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 I guess that wasn't body horror, but there's some body horror in this. There movie. is some. Yeah. There's some pretty gnarly body horror in this. Yeah, we're talking about the new Candyman, not a remake. No, it is. I think, and I I don't know if I've seen other people use this term. I think requel is the correct requel. term to use. It is like a reboot sequel that ignores all the other sequels and goes directly to the original installment and is oftentimes just named the original installment. That's the thing right now. That is that is the hot new thing. It started, I, it actually started, not the name thing, but Leprechaun Origins was a direct sequel to the first Leprechaun. So shout out to Sci-Fi oh. for the 2018 Leprechaun, or no, I'm sorry, not Origins, Leprechaun Returns. I see. Sorry, Origins was the bullshit WWE one. Uh, so shout out to Leprechaun Returns, which was an enjoyable movie, direct sequel to the, but of course the one everyone thinks about is Halloween 2018. I think Halloween's probably the the thing that made everyone think like this is what to do now. But did Halloween get it from Leprechaun? I don't think they did. But did it? <laughs> <laughs> but yes, yeah, since then we've had. Well, uh, technically, hasn't Halloween already done that too? Wasn't H two O like a weird? Well, H two O was a sequel to Halloween two. Okay, but that's it still what I had thought. its own name. That's the thing with these new ones it's that just, I don't love. I don't love it either, but I think I I do understand that it's a very good marketing thing. Yes, because. I'm someone who I've never seen the original. Mm-hmm. I, I just think they figured they're going to get less of uh, an audience for a sequel, which is fair. That's fair. Yeah. Espe- I mean, especially if it's Halloween 8 or 9 or whatever. Yeah. That's not going to. But then even Halloween subtitle might not bring in people who feel like, oh, I, but I haven't seen the first I one. I got to catch up on it. And, uh, yeah. I, I so just, I yeah. get it. I, I get, get it. it. I just don't love it. Right. I don't love it either. Yeah. But here we are. Candyman. Yes, it is a sequel. To, to the, the original, 1992 officially, yes. Bernard Rose masterpiece. Yes. Fucking love original Candyman. Probably top five for it's, me. It's top definitely in sure. my top. Yeah, I love the original movie so much. I saw it for the first time like five years ago, maybe, and it just kind of blew my mind. I it, It's weird. Like, I'd heard of it before, and I just didn't. I think I, I thought it was like ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because Candyman right. just sounds like it's gonna be a spooky candy guy. Like yeah, that. I think a lot of people think that Candyman's a slasher. Even this one, this one is almost more of a slasher. This perhaps. one definitely is more of a slasher. Than yeah, the original. but neither of them are like a Friday the Thirteenth or even like a Scream where there's like lots of ki- where it's like focused on the kids. Yeah, like I I saw a friend the other weekend and she's not a horror movie fan and I mentioned Candyman and she'd never heard of it and she was like, oh, sounds scary. And I was like, but it is. You don't <laughs> understand. The original's terrifying. And- yes, we are huge fans of the original, so obviously <laughs> kind of a high bar. Yeah. For this one uh we'll as always begin with a spoiler free review and we'll let you know when we get into the spoilers so overall um i liked a lot of things in this movie but felt that ultimately uh i just i i wanted it to be better i guess yeah i'm 
I feel the same. It's unfortunate because I really I was looking forward to this. Yes, very much. The the trailers were. I love that each trailer. I got more excited for this one, like mood wise and visually. I think this is it's so good. Um, the visuals, especially, there's such good cinematography. And- also, uh, just to put this out there, if we're your only source for horror reviews, maybe for this one, go look up someone who's like a black person's review because yeah, like- they're gonna have a different perspective and experience with this movie we're two white people saying our thoughts on the movie and you know we, we try to listen we try to learn but obviously we won't have the same life experience of someone for whom this movie is about uh, yeah and, and like the themes that this movie touches on are things that we won't have firsthand experience with right like things in this movie it's impossible for for things to affect us as a viewer the same way it will affect someone else yeah and I've seen I've seen a range in in uh black critics that I really like and and read consistently both ends of it I've seen some people love this some people absolutely hate some it. some people absolutely hated it yeah so I would say yeah go <laughs> like honestly prioritize that over us <laughs> yeah <laughs> <We're gonna laughs> if you're gonna listen to one review maybe pause us and go <laughs> listen to someone with a better perspective yeah but, but also see the movie for yourself because please do i i think it's it's so worth seeing and as of recording this i think yeah was it yesterday that nita costa is the first number like black female director to have a number one at the box office that fucking kind of blew my mind dude it's like it's a thing where like wow that's so cool but also what the fuck <laughs> like i guess thinking about it yeah yeah mm-hmm. uh that's still mind-blowing yeah, but uh is. this did do well at the box office. it did have a very strong opening weekend i think it surprised some people mm-hmm. and uh I'm, I'm very proud of its success i'm very proud of nia DaCosta. The, this is I would love <laughs> for more people to call it Nia DaCosta's Candyman. That's very frustrating. I know yeah. that, like, to be fair, Jordan Peele, he wasn't just an EP on this, like, with, like, Antebellum. He did Antebellum. co-write it. He did co-write it and produce it, not just EP. Yeah. So, like, producing it, when you are the producer of the movie, you are getting that thing made. And I think he even was the one who hired Nia. I, he, yeah. So he, he, like, formulated So. He had a lot to do, but generally you refer to a movie by the directors. I know there are exceptions. Yeah. Nightmare Before Christmas, but like. It's just interesting. It's just frustrating. Oh yeah, that is a a weird exception. Like everyone's like, oh, Tim Burton. Spielberg movies like Poltergeist and Goonies, they're like Spielberg's, even though he didn't direct those. Yeah, I get get so touchy about Poltergeist. It's Toby Hooper's (laughs) movie, damn it. We respect Toby Hooper in this house. Um, yeah, it, but still, it is interesting the difference in how we treat if it's a female director. We're so willing to give her a little bit less credit. <laughs> we're, it's, it's funny how all of a sudden people are very like, well, film is a very collaborative process. <laughs> or like often it can be like movie made by a dude director and people aren't. Well, I think it. a lot of it is marketing. Too. Yeah. Jordan Peele is a huge name right now. Yeah. Nia DaCosta has had one other film prior to this. She had a, a it's a smaller film, I think, starring Tessa Thompson. Yes. Um, that I haven't seen, but I've heard it's very, very good. I've heard it's very good. Yeah. yeah. So I am interested in that. Sadly for us who are not fans of superhero films it looks like We're her next project her to the, the marvel verse <laughs> yeah yeah i feel like that's just what happens now <laughs> come back to horror whenever you want nia because this movie looks fucking great yeah my I gosh so many of these shots yeah um i think overall though like it, it's a weird thing where i think a lot of this stuff going on and this is very interesting i mm-hmm. we, we watched it twice i yes. have so many damn notes yeah Um, we took a lot of notes we did a lot of research actually uh universal who we're kind of pals with now which is really cool uh not only sent us a screener to watch but also sent us this like reading companion yeah uh, a large pdf that is it's like 46 pages but easy to read and it just gives background and contextual information and i did check with them we can make it public okay i'll put it in the description if you want to take a look at the companion guide it's it's like 40 pages long not it, it's not it's like big dense. font don't worry yeah, yeah lots of big font I with think a foreword by uh Tanana Reeve, Tanana Reeve do yes, yeah who, who who I included a clip of in my Candyman kill count oh, really? because she's on the special features for Candyman because she's, uh, she's like a uh, a scholar on black horror she's also in 
uh, Horror Noir, I believe, yeah. is a EP on it. Yes, she is. Yeah. I, God, I forget where she teaches currently, but I just saw she was tweeting about her course that she's developing called The Sunken Place. It's going to oh, be about cool. black horror. And so, yeah, check her out. She's great. She's a good Twitter follow. It just mm-hmm. seems very like a good, generally yeah. very nice person. Yeah, big fans of her. Yeah. And dead meat. Yeah. So, so. yeah, uh, check it out, you know, because... It's, <laughs> it's a weird... It's a thing where I, I think a lot of what this movie's talking about and dealing with is really cool and it's definitely I, I like that it gets more specific than just kind of a broad take on like racism mm-hmm. it's bad guys you know? <laughs> like and I think that's often a very cynical thing that we see or I think studios have realized that audiences want movies about issues just broadly speaking and maybe don't make much of an effort to make them more specific or interesting than that. It just feels a little cheap. That's honestly something they kind of get into in this movie. Um, the yes. idea of like just broad black trauma as art, you know? Yes, yeah. Um, so yeah. I like that this movie gets more specific and a bit meta concerning stuff like that. And I think the conversation we're gonna have is interesting and I'm excited to talk about it. But just like as a movie, just purely just movie wise and story wise and how it all comes together. Three people wrote this script and I think you can tell. Yes. And I think that's maybe the biggest problem for me. It is the biggest problem for me. Uh, It feels disparate. It feels um, as though there were many, many drafts of this thing by three different people. And then they tried to kind of cobble them together with compromised uh, uh, just like collaborations there are you know there's a, a kind of a subplot with a character's ma uh dad yeah. who seems kind of out there there's a few things that feel like kind of loose ends by the time the movie's over and things that on a second viewing still didn't make a ton of sense to me and again like i i've said on this podcast before i don't need things overly explained i think that's one of my least favorite things in modern movies is the urge to just explain everything like everything must make complete sense and well they're trying not to get ding that's the thing they're yeah they're trying not to get uh <laughs> yeah um made into a everything that sucks about your movie video <laughs> but then there's also just it can go the other way though where it's like if you're trying to do a lot with a plot and it's it doesn't all kind of come together. I'm just thinking about that the whole time instead of the movie that I'm watching. Yeah, so uh, I guess I can think of four broad complaints I have with the film. One is that, like, uh, the feeling disjointed. Two, and perhaps the biggest one, is the ending. The the yeah. whole, honestly, the whole, like, last half hour, 25 minutes, like, a big chunk of this movie it, it kind of just feels like, like a different movie. Yeah, it comes out of nowhere. Yeah. And then you're when you realize like, oh, we're getting to the end here. Yeah. When did this start the happening? The end of the movie sneaks up on you, not in a good way. It, yeah. Th- the movie feels like it's it kind of builds the whole time. Like there's no, it, it feels like the movie's about to start for the entire movie. Yeah. And it's very weird. <laughs> yeah. And, and then, that, that I honestly think is, the result of three people trying to put a script together because I feel like when it's everyone's kind of different ideas of what they want this to be and everyone maybe everyone gets a little bit of their idea in this script you're then introducing all of these ideas and never really going anywhere with them like yeah and then you have to bring them all to a close yeah it's just like uh, how do it's we do this frustrating uh some of the messages feel um, just too overt, I guess. The length, the the way they the characters yeah. speak don't, doesn't feel natural. Yeah, I've, and I I've, I've seen this complaint in reviews, and I've too. seen some reviews say that it's being written for people who like don't understand these things, which isn't necessarily the best way to go about it, I guess. Uh, but I mean, I've also seen from the other side like. Oh, fucking woke Candyman. It's like, dude, did you watch the original? Right. Obviously, there are going to be these themes and everything. I just feel like the execution of some of them sometimes could have been a little better. Personally, I feel as though there are some people who the more... I, I This sounds negative, but the more like in your face the message is, the more resistant to it they're going to be. So I like it when movies 
uh, still explore these themes, but do so in a way almost to trick those people yeah. into like yeah, starting yeah, to understand sure. that point of view. Well, it's like, and again, this is the second week. This might even be the third week in a row where we're like, oh, brutal this video. <laughs> he was talking about children's programming and how oh, yeah, children's yeah. programming sucks when it's like, here's all the fun stuff. And now here's the segment where we learn about stuff. And here's like the segment where it's the moral and it's boring as fuck. And as a kid, you're like, I don't care. I'm going to just... Like, I'm just going to either fast forward this part or just not pay attention. And that's kind of what happens in this one, where it's like, here's the learning parts, and then here's the scary parts. Mm -hmm. And then the the last broad complaint I have is just some of the performances, uh, some actually entire scenes, not the main Act, no, the main, like cast the main cast is, is very great. good. Yes. Are, you, are, are we talking about the curator? I'm talking about the curator and Clyde. his girlfriend. Why they named that character Clyde? I know. Clyde Do Barker, I mean? obviously, was the, the person who wrote the story upon which the first film was based. Yeah. So kind of the source material. Uh, I think it's about time to get spoilery. Yeah, we're going to get into the spoilers now. So yeah, if you're still listening and you haven't seen the movie, really, go I would say it. stop. Go see it. Yeah. Listen to other people you talk You can think about we're full it. of shit. You might watch and be like, I don't know what the fuck they're talking about, and that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. Go for it. We start off, it's 1977. We're in Cabrini Green. We're back at Cabrini Green. Yeah. Do we know how they did this since Cabrini Green was it does not stand there anymore? I have no idea. I didn't even think about that. Because we do have a shot of the high rises. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Which uh, I believe were taken down at some point. They, yeah, I forget what you, I think they were gone by 2011. That sounds right. Like early 2010s. Yeah. Um. So I'm curious how they did this. Yeah. I mean, I think we do mostly see the row houses in this intro also, which that is what like those are the buildings from cabrini green that still exist oh okay and yeah i guess cabrini green i mean if you if you've seen the original you kind of know what cabrini green is but just you know quick rundown it was public housing on the north side of chicago they the row houses which is those are the buildings that still are there mm -hmm. we see a lot of in this movie those are built in the 40s there were these high rises built in the 50s and then these other homes, the William Green homes built in the 60s. And by the 90s, a bunch of this stuff's already being demolished. And that's when they, you know, they're filming the original. Yeah. So a lot of gang activity, et cetera, et cetera, just became a yeah, it was, crime filled place. That one mayor stayed there. Yes, for the two mayor weeks who or whatever, stayed there. The name. mayor of Chicago stayed there like for like three weeks to something. prove a point. Like, no, it's totally fine here. Yeah. <laughs> it's a thing where. And, and I, you know, we should mention that the, the high crime and just generally the conditions there are kind of a result of just the, the neglect and, and oh. segregation of this area. It was public housing and, um, yeah, just not, you know, public housing where it wasn't invested in, taken care of. And yeah, and there's a lot of that in this movie of, like, uh, the they weren't interested in helping us until, like, a white person got hurt or right. until it started to affect uh white people right yeah exactly yeah and just that area also cabrini green is kind of weird because it's in this uh, you know it's on the north side and it's surrounded by a lot of really nice air it's like this weird like really valuable land which is why a lot of it's been demolished and mm. stuff and in the movie we learn pretty much right away that our main characters live in luxury housing that was built basically on the site of the former high rises mm -hmm. so they all kind they they live in cabrini green essentially so we start with a uh, oh so we're still in this flashback there's this little boy doing laundry who we will meet him later uh still doing laundry still he just <laughs> this man loves laundry he's just always doing the laundry he goes into the laundry room and there's a hole in the wall which just instantly i think of the original there's just holes and walls and mm -hmm. just creepy spaces and then we see this candy man steps out this guy with the the coat and he's got a hook hand and he literally has candy in his pockets that he offers him uh the little boy screams and the cops swarm him yeah because the cops were looking for him they even asked the kid on his way inside the house uh or inside the high rise which by the way the kid has to go from the public housing to the high rises to do laundry that sucks yeah yeah i guess that's the only place they had the laundry machines but yeah yeah the cops were like have you seen this guy kid didn't respond but after he screams it brings the cops yeah. there and they beat the guy to death we learn later the cops are looking for him because there's been razor blades and stuff found in candy and a little white girl got hurt, so now they're all 
concerned. Look, they're looking for this dude specifically who also has happens to have a hook hand. Yeah. It's like, I guess. I don't know how that happened. Yeah, we can talk about the hook <laughs> hand thing because it kind of is, I just think like really nice coincidence i guess that this guy in life also had a hook hand and i think also worked at a candy factory in the in the little animation during the end credits oh, you so definitely good. see him coming out of like a candy factory. oh yeah i'm pretty sure so this guy's name is sherman Fields. sherman Fields, and yeah. he is this movie's candy man correct yes he is the one who is killing people as yeah. a spirit when you say when you say candy man in the mirror he's the one who shows up Yes. So what that means is Tony Todd is not Candyman in this movie. There's, he is Candyman. He is Candy. He's a Candyman. He is a Candyman. There are multiple. There's candy a man. multiverse of Candyman. <laughs> oh God! I don't hate that idea. I don't hate it either. And I think for what this movie's trying to do, like their reasoning for it, makes sense and is really kind of beautiful and sad. Yes. But I do also love the idea of like there is one candy man and it's tony todd <laughs> do you know what i mean yeah it's it's weird like i i like it both ways i guess i didn't get i didn't allow myself to get my hopes up too high for tony todd same even though i had heard he was involved and he is technically mm -hmm. uh spoiler alert he's very last line a two second DH yeah. shot of him yeah. saying, Tell everyone two words. He gets the last words of the movie, which, which is, is cool. Which is nice. And frankly, yeah, like it had to be that way, honestly. Yeah. But like, I didn't allow myself to get my expectations too high for more Tony Todd involvement. I don't know why. I guess this just doesn't fit into the story they're telling, but it does make me a little sad. Uh, I, I have to wonder how he feels about it. I know. I think he knows. He knows he's always just, he's going to be the candy. Like, he's candy, man. Yeah. I think he he has to know that this movie will never overshadow or, or like, he is the image of that character. This candy man, Sherman Fields, is very different. And even the movie is different in regards to candy man's function in it. Yes. Because in the first movie, the original, uh, it takes him a while to show up. He doesn't show up till halfway through the movie. But from that point... Even though he's not on screen a lot runtime-wise, he dominates the film. He's talking a lot with his voice. He is uh, shown clearly when he appears. Whereas in this film, Sherman Fields doesn't really talk. Mm -hmm. uh, he's pretty. He's shown from afar and through reflections mostly. You never get like the 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 hero shots of him. Even as simple as when Tony Todd is approaching Helen in the parking garage in his first appearance, you don't yeah. get that kind of like. Here's Candyman, like heroic shot. Yeah, there's not as much of a a villain in this movie. No, it's much more about uh, Anthony, and uh, yeah, it's much more about Anthony. Yeah, and I do, I do like though, kind of going back to the multiple Candyman thing. It's like it reminds me of urban legends, where everyone has a different version of whatever urban legend and it would make sense that people would be like well i heard that candy man was this guy who was giving candy to kids and they the police thought he was putting razor blades on like, like oh well i heard he was this painter who fell in love with this and so i like the idea that maybe whichever one you believe in is gonna be the one that shows up yeah that's cool. and i think that's a neat Thing. And it and that connects to the original too because the original starts off with like the urban legend retelling of Candyman. Mm -hmm. So he's always been an urban legend both within the movie and in real life. Uh, Yahya talked about in my interview with him about how like when he was he didn't really know the movie Candyman, but he knew Candyman as a concept. In general, that's and so just, interesting. Yeah, and I, I think especially uh, like black people in Chicago in the '90s. Uh, when they were young, would tell Candyman as a story almost removed from the film That's itself. That's so cool. Yeah. That's so cool. It's amazing how quickly that stuff happens. And I, I loved it. The marketing of this was they, on the official website, it was, you could say Candyman five times and it would play the trailer. And people were just like, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Absolutely it not. It has that power on some people. <laughs> it does, yeah. Oh, and one more thing about Tony Todd. I do think they used him in that Chicago installment because in the video that they cut for me, uh, I heard, I'm pretty sure his voice saying, I heard you're looking for Candyman. Oh. So I think that he might have recorded Are some lines sure? for that. Are you sure? I thought William says that in the movie. 
Uh, no, it sounded like Tony Todd. To okay, me, so interesting. He might have recorded lines. I don't know. He Tony is a voice actor, also. Yeah, does a lot of voice work. Mm-hmm. Um, I like in this laundromat. There's the poster for Bee Extermination. Yeah, I saw that. That was kind of a nice touch. So, all right. So we cut back to present day. We get our opening credits. I like these. It's like creepy upside down skyscrapers. It's so and cool. Fog. I love it. It looks like they're. It almost looks like they're going underwater. Yeah. Like the perspective, because it's a shot that I think is looking up through all these uh, skyscrapers that are going into the clouds. Yeah. But it's reversed so that it looks like a downward perspective. And yeah, it just looks like they're like dissipating into like Bespin or like some alien world. Yeah, it's it so looks weird. like alien structures or I thought maybe hives kind mm. of. Like like hanging down from something. Yeah. A lot of buildings in this I think are purposely kind of very hive looking just the uniformity of skyscrapers and stuff i love the way buildings are shot in this that's something that might be my favorite thing about this. the way buildings are shot and the way people are shot against buildings yeah. and within buildings yeah very cool shots and how you can feel very out of place in certain types of buildings mm. and versus being at home and others and it's kind of neat oh, i yeah, think it just good... visually like those movies fucking fantastic so we meet this guy, Troy, who is walking with his partner. I didn't catch his partner's name. Me neither. But Troy's taking him to meet his sister, Brianna. Brianna is in a relationship with Anthony. Yes. And so Anthony is Yaya. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Yahya? Yeah, he did say that. I, I asked for clarification. Oh, it's so funny. I know someone else. I think it's spelled a little differently because I, I worked at Kimmel for a couple of years. If you oh, watch yeah. Kimmel, Yahya is a recurring guy. Yeah, who's and I like think a- most people say Yahya. But oh, and, okay. Yeah, because it does know. take a little extra Yahya. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Anthony and Brianna live in, like we said, this apartment that is on the site of former Cabrini Green Buildings. And they're Troy, artists. huh? They're artists. Yes, they're. Or well, Anthony he is, is an, artist, an artist, and she is a curator. Is a curator, correct? So she puts together exhibits. Yes. And uh, so this scene, um, not my favorite. The I, it's a bummer because I like the opening with Candyman kind of he's coming out of the wall and it's very moody. And then this has a lot of dialogue that's like, let's explain <laughs> gentrification stuff at you and. <laughs> Oh, it's just frustrating. I, it's not that I don't like. I I think, I think whatever you know, movies are open to explore as much as they want, whatever they want. But it just it sucks when it's not done elegantly. Yeah, and it's you know, it's not even a matter of the theme that they're discussing. It just feels like clunky exposition. No matter whether it's about a theme or whether it's establishing just like their jobs or whatever. It's just they're talking in a way that real people wouldn't be talking I don't think or like real people would but I you know I could see where someone could be explaining to their friend like you know I I think especially now people do talk like that and that's I think why movies put in dialogue like this is I think people are more open to discussing social issues and stuff like that with their friends because yeah they're talking about how uh they tore down Cabrini Green and gentrified the shit out of it yeah and and Brianna says that white people built that area and then destroyed it because they kind of realized that land is valuable, right? It's like they they kind of changed their mind and like, oh, we'll gentrify because now it's valuable. And then Troy's partner (laughs) correctly kind of points out like, you live here. You live (laughs) in like the luxury buildings on um on top of this site and that's an interesting theme that kind of gets like just barely poked at, but we don't really go like the critic kind of brings it up a A little little bit bit, yeah but just the idea that like i mean i guess i guess it ties into just the kind of erasure of past like in in forgetting candy man and forgetting that story it is a bit like ignoring or forgetting that these projects used to be here and now you live on top of this site so troy is like you guys want to hear a st- scary story? Yeah, I think this whole scene where it's we're talking about gentrification and it's this kind of like clunky dialogue, I think is just to get us to the point where Troy's like, oh, let me tell you this story about, not Candyman, it's, it's explicitly not about Candyman, it's, it's about only about Helen. Helen. 
correct. Candyman is not even mentioned in this no. opening, which is very interesting. So Helen Lyle has become an urban legend herself here, which ties into the end of the first movie when she appears in the mirror and uh, kills her friggin' uh, husband yeah. who, who's sleeping with his student or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so it's cool that it continues that and like she is an urban legend. It tells the story in the paper cutout puppets that was used in the teaser trailer and that is used again throughout this film. Lots of the paper love cutouts. It. I love the love paper cutouts. Love that animation. I think it was done by Nia DaCosta herself. No, it's this artist named Kara Walker. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. It looks great. It, this is also when we get the original Candyman theme by Philip yeah. Glass, the uh, original movie, which is one of my favorite horror scores of all time. Yeah. I think it's fantastic. So, knowing that going into this, I was like, what are they going to do with the music? And I think that they wisely chose something entirely different. Yeah, they just went a totally different direction. Yeah, and you get it, uh, you get to experience it during the opening credits with those awesome shots of the building. But the new theme, and I didn't catch the composer who did it, but uh, the new theme is a lot, it's less melodic Mm -hmm. because the original one has that like hook that just gets stuck in your head. And the new one is way less melodic and just more repetitive and like pounding. And it just makes you... Uh, uh, feel it on like a deeper level. Yeah, it, this this movie in general is um, a lot less romantic. That original movie, oh, yeah. it is a love story as much as it's a horror movie. Mm-hmm. And there's it's very gothic and very romantic and very s- sexy like and sensual where none of that is in this one. It's just none. a totally different thing. And I yeah. think the score really reflects that. We don't have any of the same romance. And I think that was the right choice because I don't think, you know, you try to do another like love story, you're not going to be able to surpass no, Helen yeah. Lyle and Candyman. So right. I'm glad that they do it a different way. And that, um, and this is something that maybe we should have said more up top. The original Candyman was directed by a white man, Bernard Rose, yeah. uh, a British white man. And the protagonist that we follow throughout is a white woman. Right. And this is a a kind of reclaiming of Candyman since it is written by black people, directed by a black woman and stars uh, black, black characters cast, yeah. as, as the protagonist, which I think is really cool. And yet I also like that they still kind of keep the outsider almost exploiting the the tragedies of mm-hmm. Cabrini Green and the uh, uh, the lower income uh, parts of Chicago by having Anthony be this artist mm-hmm. like and and the conversations that they're having are not relatable to most people watching this or most people who are going to like uh, that that these other parts of the movie are about like with Troy being like Moscato's a dessert wine and they're like talking about wine and all these sure things. yeah and that's what we kind we get like such a little like a little taste of that when the, the boyfriend points out, like, you guys live in luxury apartments on top of this former projects. And, yeah, we, we get, like, little little bits of that. The idea of, of outsider, or not even outsider, but just exploitation of past pain and past loss. And, and that is the main theme, I'd say, with gentrification, uh, alongside gentrification, the, the theme of, yeah, um, almost letting other people define you by your past tragedies right or exploit your past tragedies or just only valuing you for your tragedy and not what you as a person overall have to offer there's a lot in this to be said about how much we value just artistically and commercially black pain versus black joy Mm -hmm. and even just (laughs) art by black people that doesn't relate to that you know like Black artists want to make art about other stuff. Yeah. And commercially, we deem that not as valuable because it's often we got to market to people who I think there's a weird thing where it, it's like the dad from Get Out. And I think that's why Get Out is so fucking good. But the dad from Get Out, I feel like, is often a market for this kind of shit where he wants to watch movies about black pains that he can feel better about himself. Like, mm-hmm. yes, I am doing a good thing by I'm watching not those white this. People. Yeah, I am not those people. Yeah. I am good because I'm watching this and being an ally and trying to understand. It it also is a legitimate source for art. We also get that opposing critique of like, you know, Clive, the the exhibitor, when when Anthony says something about maybe I want to do something about gentrification and the curator and the critic are both like, ah, oh, but that's kind of played though. And it's like, you all, it, it's also the idea of like, well, how can my 
genuine experience, maybe genuine trauma be played. That's not, what are you talking about? That's genuinely informing my art. You can't just pick and choose what you want and tell me that like my specific kind of, of past is cliche <laughs> like what the fuck you know mm -hmm. yeah so again like there's a lot i think there's a lot of really cool stuff going on in here yeah and that's why like i don't think this is a bad movie by any means no, no and no. I, I you know i liked it i think more than I, yeah i liked it more than i didn't like it for sure yeah because like uh, like visually i love it and i like the themes and ideas that it makes me think it's just that in in like the granular execution of some of these sure, things, yeah, yeah, I don't love. Yeah. Um, so by the way, the story of of Helen that Troy tells them, she is a very much a villain in this. She yeah. went to Cabrini Green to do her research and snapped, and she beheaded a Rottweiler and went on a killing spree. She kidnapped the baby. The baby gets rescued from the bonfire, and she just self immolates in it and it's, dies. It's the story that Helen was experiencing. Uh, and right. that she was like that. Candyman was like gaslighting her in the original, and we see that. Yeah, and that's the story that stuck. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Helen. Yeah. Yep. So yeah. Helen becomes this villainous urban legend. No mention of Candyman. Nope. Candyman does not exist in this version of the story, which is interesting because this and the companion guy touched on this a lot. The fact that Troy gets the story wrong, and it's the importance of preserving stories. The guy talks about the tradition of the griot in West African culture specifically, who mm -hmm. is this revered storyteller. It's very culturally important. Lots of like spoken oral history. The retainer of knowledge yes. and passes it down. And it's interesting because this, this type of historian and storyteller is often disregarded by Western white culture because we have this very narrow idea of like what is legitimate history, i.e. something that is written down. Mm -hmm. um, even though in this tradition of the storyteller accuracy, you know, they that's their job. They preserve these stories and pass them down. It's just a different tradition of preservation, which I thought was really interesting. And we do have kind of a griot in this movie. It's William, the laundromat, because he's the one who has, he has the key to the past. He knows all of these stories. He knows all the different versions of Candyman. He is like our, I think we kind of trust him in terms of what he's telling us. And as we will see, he thinks it is important to keep the Candyman legend alive. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I didn't realize until just this moment that, like, I can see where his concern comes from when you have Troy telling this story. Mm -hmm. And, like, Helen Lyle has replaced Candyman. This right. white woman has replaced Candyman, the black man, yeah. from his own story and has now taken on that that mythical uh, figure status on her own. Yeah, and William mentions that too when Anthony first comes to the laundromat. He's like, all these stories of, of pain and loss that happen at Cabrini Green, but one white woman goes nuts, and that's all anyone can talk about. Mm -hmm. And it, it is, I think the, the guide points this out too, but it is then appropriate that William Burke works at the laundromat. It's the imagery of cycles and this, you know, it's constantly, it's a circle. Everything is circular. He talks a lot about symmetry and everything mm -hmm. coming back in perfect symmetry. The mirror, like lots of mirrors, circles, cycles, generations, different versions of things. So the next day after he hears this, this story about Helen, Anthony has a meeting with the exhibitor, Clive, Probably our least favorite fucking dude in yeah, this movie. Yeah, fuck this guy. <laughs> Clive, like, why did they name this guy Clive? It kills me. Because, so yeah, not only, like, I mean, I have issues with his performance. I don't love it. Uh, but also, just, like. Just who he represents in this. Yeah, he's, like, a shitty guy. And we're going to name, yeah, name him after Clive Barker. I would understand maybe if you wanted to do a bit of meta naming him Bernard. Because Bernard is the one who took the the story. The It's the Forbidden, right? Yes. Um, and, and made it into Candyman, and he's the one who made it into a story about race. The yeah. original story by Clive Barker is not, it's set in Britain. Mm -hmm. It is about, it's, it, it's, a class it's about thing. class, correct. And the movie is what made it, you know, set in Cabrini Green, made it about race, uh, gentrification, appropriation. I could see maybe kind of as a little joke naming that guy Bernard, but Clive, I just like, why? Yeah, Leave like, Clive this guy alone. Sucks. Yeah, yeah, he says that he wants uh, Anthony, who hasn't, who hasn't done a new art in two years, to to be the great black hope of Chicago art. Yeah, the great art. black hope of Chicago. And he tells him, dig into that history of yours, which we kind of talked about a little bit earlier. This, the the you know 
kind of dominant white voice of culture wanting to use you know black people's history specifically pain to yeah, capitalize on because mm -hmm. they see it as marketable and that's and the thing they're interested sell it in and, right yeah and and it's funny because it not only is it i want to use your your history and perhaps your pain but yeah, but not that pain that you mentioned, because like we've seen that before, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I, you know, not this thing. Just very picking and choosing and deciding which aspects of a person <laughs> you're gonna use to sell. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, it is. It's like history as aesthetic, and in in this companion guide, they talk about Zora Neale Hurston's. Uh, concept of the three and four walled rooms. Did you read that part? Yeah, I read that. So this idea of black lives and black culture existing in a three walled room, meaning there's one wall that's open and that wall is always open in regards to white culture, white people being allowed to always look in. It's very voyeuristic being allowed to observe and inspect and analyze. And Zora Neale Hurston kind of you know, traveling across the US would find towns and communities that she considered these four walled rooms where they're very insular. The like culture had not yet been either appropriated or influenced by white communities. And I thought that was interesting, but there is a lot of three walled room, especially even literally Anthony's exhibit with the mirror that you open up and you can stick your head in reminded me of that idea of the mm. three walled room and holes in walls, being able to crawl through walls yeah. and stuff is I think kind of a take on that too. Yeah, while well, at the same time tying back to the original where uh, it's Sabrina Helen literally Green, is Helen, Helen climbs climbing through, the through window. Yeah, and she out climbs of candy through. Man's mouth. <laughs> yeah, like Helen in that original is climbing through holes in walls, the mirror, the it, it's interesting. I don't even know if the original is intentionally doing that with this concept mm -hmm. in mind but i think it's so appropriate um so anthony decides all right i'm gonna shift my focus i'm gonna do art about cabrini green which is he goes on on his research and this is kind of him this isn't his authentic past or not as far as he knows <laughs> we yeah. find out later no this very much is where he is from if you haven't figured it out by now yeah he's the little baby he's at the, the end of the first one the original and i don't think they tried to make that secret if you have seen the original no it's pretty easy to the baby's name out. is anthony his name's anthony yeah and his name is anthony yep exactly yeah so and they're like talking about his mom throughout they're like you gotta go see your mom your mom wants oh to my see world's you just waiting yeah bring us vanessa williams <laughs> wanted more of her than this oh my god i cannot believe that's how a complaint that of mine looks. i wanted more vanessa that e williams yeah. yes it's vanessa e williams yeah because there's the, Cause other the singer yeah. Williams, yeah okay that makes sense um so anthony there there's a really short montage that I like of him walking over to Cabrini Green past all these empty luxury apartment buildings where it's just all these high rises that are clearly new builds and they've got four lease signs on them. Everything looks pretty weird and desolate. And it reminded me, we were just in downtown LA and I was pointing out the same thing when we were going around for a walk. I was like, look around how, and, and just look at all the buildings and how all of them have empty storefronts in them and then just empty apartments just four lease for sale signs everywhere in these kind of new builds la you can see a lot of that all over the place yeah, yeah. i will say though that after that montage after that bit I think the movie loses its Chicago setting. It does. I that's a complaint I have. That too. it's not an original uh, complaint. It's something I, I read in other people's reviews. But like reading it, I was like, oh yeah, that first movie feels so Chicago. It does, yeah. And this one, that that little montage is great, and you see the city. Yeah. But then after that, it just feels so small. It does. I I it sucks that this montage is like the last really strong reminder of where Cabrini Green is located because it's very important to understand how surrounded it is by all this new build stuff. Yeah, and, and that though that contrasting mm -hmm. image was prominent in the original. Yeah, and just I think really drives home how valuable the land is that Cabrini Green is sitting on. And it's something that um, I, I, I think is interesting to consider. Like when we talk about a poor country, um, the uh, poor countries very often, they're not poor. They're, they're poor, you know, if, especially if there are, maybe we have business interests there. They had, they're very rich in resources. Mm -hmm. The people there are poor, they are kept poor, but the land, everything that is there, 
very wealthy, right? And that reminds me a little bit of Cabrini Green in this area. We t- we talk about Cabrini Green like, oh, it's this very poor area. It's not poor. The land that this they sit on is so desired, and mm-hmm. it's just the concept of like, well, who owns it and who who benefits when that land gets sold? Certainly not the people who live there. When Anthony gets to Cabrini Green, he he printed out this picture earlier of this church that is. Um, the building is still there. It's in it's in the Cabrini Green area, and the picture he prints out has there's a mural on the front of this church, and we see it's a shot of he has he's holding up the picture. He brings it down. The church is completely it's white. It's painted white. This story, like man, when I was researching this, I was getting real pissed off. Uh, so- yeah, because watching the movie, I wrote down oh literal whitewashing. Mm-hmm. Uh, because, yeah, it is now a church that has been painted entirely white as opposed to the colorful art that we see in the past. But I didn't realize that that wasn't a movie thing. Yeah, that's very effective imagery, by the way. Mm-hmm. The Just the literal whitewash. That is real. They didn't, like, make up this building for the movie. But just all you need is the before and after the picture. You instantly understand what's happened here. And this so this building is the Northside Strangers Home Missionary Baptist Church. And this church on the outside used to have a mural painted in 1972 by William Walker called All of Mankind and it had all of these figures of like Malcolm X, Fred Hampton, and Frank, basically people who throughout humanity's history have been essentially martyred for being who they are fighting for for justice for other humans and for themselves and it's this very beautiful mural William Walker has a few other murals. Some still exist, I think, on the south side. But in um, 2015, so this church was privately owned. And 2015... That's so recent. It's Man, it it sucks. And people fought really hard to prevent this from happening. Um, The the owners of the church were trying to sell it because, again, this area, very valuable. And they thought, well this building is going to be more valuable if we paint over this mural and they completely painted over this historical this piece of art that is just gone it was the last of three murals that walker did in that area why would they think it was because they're like why would they think that's not valuable because it's it's and i i think it's why like specifically showing that before and after it's disregard for black art and it's it's erasure of history and, and priceless art and stories. Like compare this, because this was the first I heard about this church. I didn't know about this before I did research for this movie. Compare this and this loss of art and the general si- like silence. Again, I had never heard about this. Compare this to Notre Dame when it caught on fire a couple years ago. Everyone rightfully was freaking out that that's years of art and history lost why like we should always be trying to prevent things like this from happening and being mournful when this happens because that is like a historical site that like that's it's history that we've lost it's art can you imagine them trying to level like uh i don't know I think this article I was reading compared it to like if someone just demolished a Frank Lloyd Wright building because they thought it would be more valuable if the land didn't have the structure on it. It would be like insane. Are there are there chemicals that can I've seen them restore paintings. Restore I have no idea. I wonder though if Yeah, if, that if there's would a way be... to just get rid of that top layer. I don't of, know. I don't know, man. That that's very upsetting to learn about. It though. it really sucks. Like it, it really was like devastating to learn about and it's um and i'm assuming uh, assuming william walker is, has passed i believe so yeah. yeah and yeah it's it's that's also the problem when we have just you know the problem of kind of this company ownership of buildings private ownership where like we prioritize capital above all else it's like well if capital is a priority by art you know if if we deem it not profitable to keep around Mm -hmm. then that's all gonna get destroyed um sucks especially i think racism plays into it this is a black artist and this is you know art made in an area where most of the people who are gonna be seeing it every day are black i think it's made for like enjoyment of a black neighborhood Mm -hmm. therefore to a lot of people who cares right 
So yeah, uh, Anthony's walking around taking pictures. He gets stung by a bee. Ugh, the beginning of the, some of the grossest, like, skin Yeah, this bee stings stuff. him in the hand, and that hand is going to fester, and uh, trypophobiacs might want to avoid the end of this Dude, movie. Dude, there's, like, holes in skin. It's yeah, gross. Just, and he's picking at that thing Man, the whole he won't, time. He his cannot fucking, stop picking at At one hand. point, his fingernail just slides no. off. It's Ew. real fucking gross. I did not... Go into this movie expecting body horror. Dude, that's like, it reminded me of Black Swan, where it's like, oh, oh yeah. all of a sudden we're just peeling back skin from Ew, around God, her nails. It's, it's real gross. I don't love skin stuff. And I hate it and love it. Yeah, I, he's like picking into it. It's, it's so disgusting. gooey. It's fucking gross. So this bee that stings him, <laughs> uh, like it, it's on the ground dying. It gets swarmed by ants. They called police the swarm a lot in this movie. Yeah. I noticed like here that comes a lot. the swarm. Mm -hmm. So it was like it reminded me of that, and it also kind of reminded me. I think the fact that it happens outside of this church that we were just talking about. It's like this ritual consumption of black pain, um, death by dominant white culture. You know, just like oh, time for the swarm to come in and devour this thing. You know, circle mm -hmm. of life kind of shit. Yeah, because this is when he meets William Burke, the laundry guy, yes. who uh, is in Cabrini Green. I also, was he named William after William Walker? Oh, I don't Maybe. know. Maybe. I mean, William's also a very common, common name. Yeah. But. Uh, but yeah, he meets William Burke, who kind of tells him, like, oh, yeah, uh, they don't really come around here unless, like, they need to. Is it to keep us safe or keep us in? And, the, yeah, he talks about, uh, he tells the story of the beginning of the movie because that was him as a little boy and he does use the term they swarmed him mm -hmm. and beat him to death and yeah he... this is the first time anthony hears the word candy man because he yes. asks what's candy man yeah what's candy man oh it's this for me he says candy man with sherman fields right and tells that story and uh you can tell he, he feels guilty that his scream is what brought the police in yeah. to and uh led to this man's death which by the way he specifies they uh killed him and were looking for him because they were finding razor blades and candy that killed a white girl after killing Sherman Fields. There's still razor blades. There yeah. were still razor blades and candy, so obviously got the wrong guy. Can I talk now? I, I want to bring it up now because I like kind of made a mental note that I wanted to bring it up later. The hook hand, like the fact that Sherman has a hook yes. hand. Here's maybe what I would have done. I think I personally like the idea of maybe in real life he did not have a hook hand, but just as a legend people retroactively giving him one because Candyman always has to have one it's weird and so maybe all versions of Candyman in death their vision that appears in the mirror they all have hook hands even if in real life they didn't yeah i like the idea of maybe retroactively making him look a bit more like the idea that everyone has in their heads about yeah because because otherwise this otherwise, is just it, some innocent guy who gave out candy and who also, he also happened has a to hook have hand. a hook hand and also happened to wear the same kind the of same coat kind of jacket it's just all. you know it's again <laughs> it just I, feels like conflicting things it's i i don't know it just seems like a lot it seems like a pretty great coincidence and or it could also be is this him like his is this his me memory being a bit fallible but also i don't think it is because again he's positioned as this very reliable narrator of sorts like we trust him that's the point mm -hmm. is he is he functions as the storyteller i don't know yeah anyway it bugs me <laughs> william tells him about Candyman, and that inspires Anthony. Finally, he feels yes. the inspiration to art. Yeah, he, he has this very weird relationship with this story because it's him first having the normal and expected reaction of like, oh, fuck, that story is terrible. But mm -hmm. I can use this story to make some cool art and get some new art for this gallery show, right? Again, it's this kind of exploitation of pain and i wonder if it even is like not not necessarily saying as much about anthony as it is about like the this desire by by white you know exhibitors media culture at large to exploit black pain if if you hadn't had this this guy clive being like I think your your past is kind of boring. I'm over it. Find something else. Now Anthony is forced to take someone else's pain and use mm -hmm. it. And the drawing he does, uh, the painting he does, 
is inspired by Sherman Fields. Yeah. It's, it's like a um, black man's face with a bunch of like hands white hands stuff. like uh, beating him. And this he when he shows Brianna, uh, this is when she says, there's not much room for viewer interpretation. Yeah. Which is something to say. In a movie like this. Isn't this wild? Like, yeah. I think that's what's happening here. Is I think this is, like, critique of media that is huge now where, like, there isn't room to interpret. The message is there and it's frustrating. But that's what happens a lot in this movie. It does. But then, you know, she says that and then he does say after that, okay, but how does it make you feel? Right. And she says, it's painful. So I'm not sure if that dialogue is making a case of, yes, this movie might not be super subtle in its messaging, but, but it's if it real. makes you feel something, sure. then that's what it's trying to do. Sure. Yeah. I don't know. It's a, Yeah. Again, I, this movie's interesting. I like talking about it. Yeah. I love talking I like about every it. Every scene is very loaded with stuff to talk about. Mm -hmm. I do love when he is painting this thing the first brush stroke just keep in mind for a cool visual there's mm -hmm. a very nice visual parallel later that i really loved um but yeah like go it's a horizontal brush stroke that goes across and then it dissolves into a panning shot from outside and it uh pans over to him working and it's much later at night and so it's like a good he's been working on this all day i yeah. love it it's a very cool shot I, I have here, too, that I think Anthony is an example, not just of him kind of using someone else's pain to make art, but just what happens to him as he is compelled to make art that is just painful. And, like, Brianna even says, like, this is, like, it, it's awful to look at. You know? mm -hmm. Like, it's just it's painful to look at. And it it's like, what happens to a person when you tell them that, like, that's the only thing worth hearing about from them? I think that's why we get this stuff with Brianna's dad, because her dad, it seems, also was a painter and very unwell. And I think she maybe is a little freaked out by another man in her life who is an artist finding inspiration and using pain as fodder for their art because that must you know have a psychological effect and it's like what does that do to you in the long run where that's what's that's what people tell you is important about you is like how hurt you are yeah and that's you know that works as far as the inclusion of that subplot because but i know i just like in movie terms i'm like i wish we had more of it but i yeah. think i get what they were doing with it. Yeah, it just does kind of feel like a loose end, like you said, at least upon first watch. But I also think it uh, works. I, I was telling you earlier that, uh, you know, we're about to get Candyman's first victims and Brianna is the one who finds the bodies. And later she has the nightmare about seeing her dad uh, kill himself by jumping mm -hmm. out the window. And I think that just having had that experience with someone whose um, uh, uh, mental issues caused them to do that is at least a justification for why she is so unwilling to believe Anthony yeah. with all the stuff that he talks about later that would sound uh, crazy if you're not in a horror movie. You know? Yeah, yeah. Hey, I want to talk to you about our sponsor this week, Blender's Eyewear. So sunglasses especially, I think, are a weird thing because they're necessary. You should wear sunglasses when you're outside to protect your eyeballs. And you want them to be nice, you want them to be comfortable, you want them to look good. But they're also a thing that you're just gonna lose inevitably. I've lost so many pairs of sunglasses. I had one beloved pair go into a toilet in Las Vegas. <sighs> R.I.P. But blenders are kind of the best of both worlds. They are cute, stylish, really well made, and they're also affordable. So when the inevitable happens, it's not that big of a deal. <laughs> They've got all kinds of styles. They've got polarized wraparounds, tortoise shell frames, purple lenses, all kinds of colors to the more classic styles as well. And they don't just have sunglasses. They also have prescription glasses, reading glasses, 
blue light filtering glasses, and they also have a snow collection with goggles and accessories. So if you want to try Blenders, you can get 15% off of your Blenders purchase if you visit BlendersEyewear.com and use the promo code DEADMEATVIP. BlendersEyewear.com, code DEADMEATVIP for 15% off. Blenders, rocked with pride worldwide. Our other sponsor this week is HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. We're getting into fall now. That means back to school, which is a busy time for us. Fall means October, our busiest month of the year. I am honestly scared just thinking about it and not scared in a fun way. <laughs> but HelloFresh will help you save time with meal prep. It's been such a lifesaver to have these pre-prepared meals at home. They take about 30 minutes or less. And what's nice is they offer a very wide variety too. So I personally don't eat red meat and they have so many great options for me. I do appreciate when places acknowledge that just because someone doesn't eat meat doesn't mean they just want to eat salad forever. HelloFresh is also about 30% cheaper than going to the grocery store. If you look at the portion sizes versus how much actually gets wasted, because it's easy to just buy a bunch of food and have it go bad in the fridge, you're not going to be wasting money on stuff that you don't use on time and that just goes in the garbage. Also, because fall is coming up, they are doing special fall recipes, and I've definitely mentioned these before, but these pumpkin cinnamon rolls sound real good. I'm very, very excited for these. So if you want to try HelloFresh, go to hellofresh.com slash deadmeat14 and use code deadmeat14 for up to 14 free meals, including free shipping. One more time, that is hellofresh.com slash deadmeat14 and use code deadmeat14 for up to 14 free meals, including free shipping. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Anthony suggests a fun little date night activity where they say Candyman five times. Oh, that's right. We got have, he does say Candyman five times into the Brianna mirror says, or into the window. Fuck no. Yeah, I love how Brianna is uh, a intelligent horror movie character. Yeah. Throughout, you know, her brother's like, "You want to hear a scary story?" And she's like, "No." No. And he's like, "Let's do Candyman," and she's like, "No." And then spoiler spoiler alert at the end when she uh, stabs the guy coming after her. She double taps. She yeah, fucking she does. She doesn't does do taps it. that guy. She makes sure that he's dead. So she is very That's much so, an yeah. active horror movie character. I didn't even think about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she knows how to survive a horror movie. Yeah, for sure. it's all it's almost meta. The things a that she bit, says and yeah. the thing that she does. I think it's interesting that in this universe, Candyman for these characters, they learned about him like two days ago, and yet. Brianna's like, I'm not saying Candyman five times. <laughs> Get the fuck out of here. And I just wonder, it's it's interesting, like, that some of these characters, like, Troy also is like, ugh, no, not saying Candyman five times, that they're, like, just as scared of this as if, as people are, like, in real life, mm -hmm. like, going, go to the website, say Candyman, like, like, no, fuck no. <laughs> but I just think it's, I think it's, like, I just wonder... I don't know, because for me, I feel like it's such a childhood thing almost, because like I grew up with like Bloody, Bloody Mary, Mary yeah. and I still, I don't like the idea of going in a dark bathroom and saying Bloody Mary in the movie. Yeah, like, I remember fuck that you shit. wouldn't do it. I won't do it, but, and do it, it. but it's, it's just weird. I just think it's interesting that these characters don't have that association with him and yet act as if it's this thing that they've always been scared of. Hmm. I don't know. I just wonder what that is. It just, it already is so potent for them. So... Yeah, now... Oh, they do end up saying Candyman five times and in this movie. And do we movie. see something in the reflection? We do, yeah. yeah. He's back there. This whole movie is now just find Full Candyman. Yeah. He's everywhere. Yeah. So, gallery night, Anthony's exhibit. He has this mirror cabinet that opens up. Reminds me a lot of the first movie with mm -hmm. the mirror cabinet. There's a white woman art critic there named Finley. Yeah, who, who is not Virginia Madsen. No, but she looks just she like looks Virginia so Madsen. Much like that her. had to be intentional casting. Holy shit, that woman looks like she Virginia looks, Madsen. I thought it was her. The you whole thought time. it was her? Yeah. I was like, yeah, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> it doesn't. No, I thought it was just her playing a different character. Yeah. I don't think, I, I just think she is an older woman now. 
Uh, oh, then, I just, I don't know. I just, yeah, I mean, she is kind of ageless. And I think she lends her voice to the recording he listens to when he yes. rents. Uh, that had to have been new voice recording from her. Yeah. So Anthony's little exhibit, because it's like this bathroom mirror that opens up and all his paintings are in this room. Mm-hmm. And he has a little handout that goes with it that has instructions. It has kind of the history of Candyman and then also how to summon him. So no one does it the whole night. No, I real like no one does it. Anthony, like I feel so bad. His art doesn't get he, get participate. That's why he gets drunk and then has this weird interaction. I hate it. It's so it's with this random character who we don't even know. He's just this artist who's an absolute prick and is just there to be mean to Anthony. Yeah, and but he he does the whole like pretending to be nice while being mean thing. He's like, I love your exhibit. It was such a good idea to put all your art in this room where no one can see it. <laughs> yeah, something like that. And it, it it can be confusing on first watch when you don't know who he is, when he's saying it in like an opposite tone. And then some of the line deliveries are just kind of rushed because like Anthony so at this point- It's so hard to hear some dialogue. In character is, is drunk. And so, and he's making some choices with these these drunk lines. I do kind of like when he's like leaving and he's like, I did think of that bitch. Yeah, like, I know. I like that. It's very sassy. Too. But uh, yeah, it, it, I don't know. I don't love this interaction. No, I don't either. And like the Clive, the Fucking gallery Clive. guys making fun of Anthony too. Everyone's just mean to Anthony and it sucks. I, not Virginia Madsen tells <laughs> Anthony that his exhibit is cliche thinks art about gentrification is cliche again. She's like, you it's, people do the whole gentrification oh thing. Oh my God, just like, a real strong me. you people. And, and she's then like, artists, artists, of course. Artists move into these communities. and So they can dick around without yes, having to worry about a job. Right, because the rent's cheap and stuff. Also, we, we see at the very beginning of the scene, this high school girl who's here and she gets a little pamphlet and like almost summons Candyman. But also, who is this student? I just, because we... We see her later, and she's clearly kind of a mean girl. There's this other girl they're they're bullying who's she's hiding in the stall, and in just some like it did say it was a uh, a college prep school, so oh. maybe you know so so it's again a like privileged school. It's not like a public school. Yeah, it's like a private oh. prep school, and so maybe that was part of it. Oh, was okay, because like, I was wondering exhibit. like who are yeah, you that you're like this, this mean, but you go to these art galleries yeah. on the weekend. Maybe she got extra credit for doing that. It made his... me feel like, do you remember the 21 Jump Street movies where they go back to high school and they dress, like they're just expecting high school to be like it was in the 2000s where all the popular kids are like mean jocks, but like now idiots, it's cool yeah. to be like into like artsy stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's like, that's how this made me feel. I was like, maybe that's normal. I don't know. <laughs> and now it's my least favorite scene in the this movie. This is probably my least favorite scene. Fucking Clive and his fucking girlfriend. What's her name? Jerrica? I just have Joy Division written down. Yeah, she, she like says Joy, Joy Division. Division. No, I, I remember Jerrica because it's almost Jericho. Jericho so She's like Jer- the Ayatollah of art exhibits. Yeah, so Clive's <laughs> cleaning the gallery and is bitching about how no one ever, no one ever says thank you to him uh, and how it's so hard to be Clive and then they start doing this weird kinky thing she like she has belts these, herself like, to him weird belt clips and she they like hook themselves together and they're like let's fuck and say candy man i don't know it reminded me of the opening of the first movie i guess where it's, it's like fucking intro to bondage it or just some sucks shit. i just hate them um yeah and but we get the cool imagery because they say candy man five times don't do they because i only heard it four times they, from her. i think they i count they say it five times does she say it Five times or do inc- collectively? I think collectively they and say And I think so. that's bullshit. What are the rules? What I don't are, know. You can't, you can't fucking fill in for another person's candy man. I don't know. Because the whole point is they've got to say it five times. I don't know. I call bullshit. I hate so, it. So we see, we see candy man in the reflections because a lot of these exhibits are like mirrored surfaces and stuff. And we get this cool thing where he's like, in the reflection, we see him ripping this projector screen. And in real life, the projector screen is ripping also, but it's an invisible person doing yeah. it. It kind, kind of looks of, weird CG, though, when the screen falls to the ground. When it falls down, it might it be weird. CG. But uh, yeah, he's, he slits her throat. Yeah, Jerica's Joy throat. Division. Jer- Jerica gets her neck slashed. Clive then, is yelling, is this real? Which is fair. That's fair. But then when he's trying to unbuckle himself 
from her from their weird like v- you know baby's first kink thing yeah uh <laughs> he says must go faster yeah guys why are we quoting jurassic park why would we this... have that line here and it's so i feel like this scene is supposed it's gotta be one of the first big like big scares it's supposed of this to be a movie. scare and this jackass is doing like a bit during it and i just have to wonder did no one on set realize it was a jurassic park quote was that an ad lib is that was it in the ad-lib? script yeah it like, like or like you have an invisible killer coming towards you and you're like must go faster must go faster it's just i hate it i don't understand why that line is in there it's i'm surprised like, he wasn't like oh uh objects in mirror may be closer than they appear it's just i just don't like why it's dumb because i feel like though, the, it, it really like sucked a lot of the air out of the scene in terms of it being scary yeah it, it removes the scariness of it yeah even so. though the visuals are cool yeah, Clive's ankle gets all fucked up. He That's gets cool. smacked into the ground. He lifted up and killed. Brianna comes back the next morning. Oops. <laughs> uh, they're both dead. Yeah. Then we get a news report. And I, lo- I love this scene a lot. Um, by the way, poor Brianna. Brianna just walks in on everyone else's shit this <laughs> whole movie. Like, her whole life, I feel like it's just fucked up shit happening in front of her. Um, hope she finds a good therapist after this <laughs> one. Uh, so, Yeah. Uh, there's a news report the next day. Uh, hand update. Anthony's hand is disgusting. <laughs> yeah, it is. Just very flaky. It's very, like, marshmallow that got burnt texture. Oh. It's not great. His eyes are also kind of really glazed over at the beginning of the scene. Well, watching the report because yeah. they're talking about his exhibit that Dude, the bodies this is were the found best. in front of. There's this news report where the reporter's like, oh, my God, this gallery, two bodies were found, blah, blah, but they were found murdered in front of artist Anthony, well, I don't remember his McCoy? last name. Anthony McCoy's piece. Uh, say my name. Say my name, blah, blah, blah. And <laughs> like, Anthony blinks and he's like, they said, wow, he they he said, I'm on the news. Yeah. And, and then it, it wide shots to Brianna and Troy just being like, um. Just jaws drop. Just the most like, dude, what the fuck? And she walks Brianna away gets, and he's like, no, I mean, it's it's sad, but like. It's sad, but it's cool they, they cool, said my cool name. Cool to be recognized, I guess. It <laughs> felt like <laughs> Anthony in this scene felt like an always sunny character. Like, it's yeah, always like they would sure. like have someone murdered in front of their modern art at a gallery to get on the news and be like, we did it. We're on yeah, the news. Yeah, no, it's awful. It's horrible. But. Yeah, but. <laughs> think, but. Think about it. Yeah, it's it's such always sunny behavior. And <laughs> so now this night, Brianna has a dream about her dad. That's when we see the flashback of like her yeah, dad. Yeah, decent little jump yeah. scare of it. Because it's like one of those double dream things. Yeah, she wakes up she and then twice. corpse in the uh, bathroom. When she wakes up for real, Anthony's in the bathroom all zoned out. Yeah, and then because when he I like, had a bad dream. And she's like, man, me too. What was, what was it? And then he goes, what was what? And it's really creepy. Yeah, and then he like... Okay, and he like closes the door on her, and the reflection just doesn't match his yes. action, which we always like. I'm such like. a fucking sucker for that shit. Yeah, and this a... scene does it great because his reflection does match the entire time, except for the tiniest like the very bit at end. the end. Yeah, I love it. So now Anthony goes to the library, finds Helen's notes from the original movie, he listens to um, get some Virginia Madsen voice. Yeah, cameo. she's talking about Candyman as collective unconscious. Oh, that's when. Uh, I'm sorry. This is this is the last kind of shot that really shows you Chicago because this is that long shot on the bridge when he's walking to go there. That yeah, I, that I think might be a reference to a shot. In the original, near the end, after Helen escapes the psychiatric ward and she's walking back home, there's like a long shot that zooms in as she's walking over the river. And this is a different street, but uh, yeah, same kind of shot. Totally. Yeah. So I just want this elevator sequence. I wanted more from it. Yeah. This is a very like trailer scene. Yeah. A lot of this was in the trailer. He, he looks up. He sees Sherman Fields uh, looking the, out because it's all glass. The elevator's all like it's mirrored. It's like infinite yeah, mirrors. reflective. Uh, but that's it. He looks up, sees Sherman Fields this looking out at him. Candy falls from the ceiling. Candy the falls. The lights go out and there's a bunch of really gross like crunching and cracking noises. Mm-hmm. So I'm expecting like what the fuck are we going to see when these lights come back on? But the lights come back on and it's just Anthony sitting on the floor. Like, I, just, I just felt so let down by this scene. Yeah. I really wanted a good visual scare here also there's like that cute librarian who's into him yeah and and then he just like walks away and then for some reason someone on wikipedia wrote that that was supposed to be helen lyle or some shit quit editing wikipedia and imdb with your bullshit fan theories okay you're not the writer don't add that shit yeah the art critic now is very interested in anthony's art because Mm -hmm. people got murdered in front of it 
So she invites him over. Her apartment building is really creepy looking. We got this, these cool shots of him walking down these hallways and that they're like all curvy curves to and the right. Yeah, it's they very seem never cool. ending. And so I have here that I, I want to see Nia DaCosta do a building or do a, a movie that's all set within like brutalist looking buildings, those big concrete slab type buildings. Mm-hmm. She's like, she'd be able to film those real good. It's really cold, open structures. The critic says Anthony's art is very macabre and it's. Wow, it's made eternal with tragedy, which that sounds a little bit like a character we know. <laughs> a little, little Mr. Candyman, <laughs> eternal with tragedy. And that's part, that's his whole aim in the first one is yeah. to become eternal through tragedy. So Anthony says he's expanding his series. And then he also goes off on her about her comment about artists and how it's developers who invite preferably white artists to these areas that get gentrified. We'll they get increase you a whole property foods. value, blah, blah. Yeah. Again, this is like a little. A little Ted talky, I guess. Just like a little bit, yeah. This one feels more like motivated, at least, mm-hmm. because she made a comment earlier. Yeah, and it's like him, you know, if he has these views that could be like, a, it's it's really that first scene where it's like people who already are on the same page, like talking yeah. to each other as though the, they were introducing the I- sure. these ideas for the this first time. Sure, this feels a bit more earned, I yeah. guess. Yeah. So then he dares her to go to the bathroom and say Candyman five times, so she gets up to use the bathroom and he uses this chance to pick at his awful skin and it's off it's gross it's like very pink underneath and it's, it's really gross and he even is like oh fuck i think he picks too much of it she's gone for a while so he goes to kind of look for her and this is when we get a very cool scene with him yeah. in a mirror i fucking love this because he looks in the mirror and sees sherman fields he sees himself as candy man and it's uh you know it's the thing where He'll move and the reflection will move. And there's just, I don't know if they put a post-production effect on the movement of Sherman Fields, but it just looks so eerie. The the movement and the the speed of the movement, and yet it's matching everything that Yahya is doing. And I just, you know, when I'm watching it, I'm really thinking of how fucking insane it would be to look in the mirror and see something that's not you but still doing all the actions you're doing. That's scary as shit to me. Yeah, it's terrifying. And I, I love this scene. I just love the effect. Yeah, it's it's very cool. I like how, again, just more cool shots of hallways and weird shaped doors. This mm-hmm. scene felt, it reminded me a little, like a little Kubricky. And I know yeah, Kubrick, a bit. I think Kubrick is an overused director in terms of comparing stuff to him. But I can say But that. I'm gonna say it here. <laughs> just the way that stuff is framed and the architecture of this building just like just weird shapes and stuff Mm -hmm. i don't know something about it and like she comes out of the bathroom and he like runs away yeah we see canyon behind her in the Mm -hmm. mirror too so we know she said it five times yeah and then it cuts to a shot outside her apartment building this very long zoom out yes and we see her like through the window we see all these other people through the windows of their apartments but her in her apartment through the window and then we see her getting she gets picked up by an invisible person and slashed across the neck and she gets smeared across the window and it looks exactly like the paintbrush mark from yeah. earlier it's like the same exact shape everything that, this might be my favorite shot i love this shot it's, it's so, so good cool. i love it yeah like that that whole sequence everything in finley's apartment from when he's walking down the curving hallways to that last shot of us seeing her dead, I think is great. There's a, I think there's an Argento movie that I believe this is an homage to, fuck, I forget what the, uh, ah. Bird of the Crystal Plumage. Oh, which itself is referenced in Suspiria. Yeah. Okay, so we cut to this dinner with this exhibitor who's here from New York. Anthony's like just freaking out, man. It's like the zoom out of him sitting at dinner, just clearly. He's still picking his skin in some random way. He's like, stop it. Yeah, she's like, <laughs> careful. Yeah. Like, fair. It's gross. And we're all trying to eat. Yeah, we're food. at a dinner table. That one other asshole artist is there. Yeah. Still don't really know who he is, but. Yeah, The this reminds me of the dinner with the professor in the original movie. Oh. Candyman country. Yes, it's <laughs> yeah, like Candyman country. I love the way <laughs> he says guy. that. That like those words and the way he it just lives in my head. I get, I forgot that that guy shows up in Candyman the sequel too. Country. He's in Candyman two and he gets killed. I was about to yeah because isn't he touring with his book and shit? I, that yeah, that's character? like in the beginning of the the second one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The second one's okay. It's the third okay. one is garbage. It's not good. <laughs> um, 
So, yeah, and he's like, oh, yes, visiting Chicago is so provincial. <laughs> <laughs> then they all get an what alert. What does that mean? Oh, I guess, like, quaint? Because he's from New York. Cause yeah. It's, it, I think it's a, it's just There a, is, yeah, some discussion of, like, oh, you want to go to the real city and, New and York. do work? Yeah, it's yeah. this gag, I think, because often I, we love people from New York, but <laughs> New York often thinks it's kind of the center of the world. And that's, you know, Chicago. It kind of is, but yeah. Yeah, but you know it. Yeah, but yeah, we don't need to hear about it all the time. All right, <laughs> right. and just the disdain <laughs> of... I mean, the fact that flyover country is a slang yeah, I, term. Yeah, I try to never use that term. No, no, it's, so, it's not nice. Yeah. So they all get news alerts on their phone that this critic is murdered. Anthony's like, oh, I got to return some videotapes. <laughs> Le- fucking runs. I like how Brown is just like, Anthony. <laughs> she knows something's fucked up. Poor, poor Brianna. This whole movie. So we could. I also want to say uh, there are enough scenes early on that show them having a real cute relationship that I appreciate. Yeah. Because, yeah. like, by the end, it, it is tragic, uh, you know, what happens to him and how it affects her. And I think that that could have just been, you know, kind of wrote and expected uh, or just, like, expect the audience to feel those things. But there are enough scenes where, I mean, and Tiana Paris is fantastic. Uh, yeah, she's, I like her a lot. Yeah, she's very likable, and I think her and... Um, They're just a really attractive couple. I felt like a... I can't believe we haven't talked at all this whole time. I felt time like a goblin watching this about movie. About fucking Yahya's... Just everything. Body. He's so I mean, also his everything, but they, they, he's in his underwear a lot in the movie. Uh, yeah. I don't know how you've interviewed both him and Tony. How have you not exploded? Oh, yeah. yeah, right? I, I was there know. for the Tony interview. Tony is great. He's a very nice man. Um, and all, yeah, just insane. Like, just so the presence is real. Mm-hmm. I, being around Tony, because his, his voice, is, I mean, that's his fucking voice. Yeah. And he's just tall and handsome. And he, but you you chatted with Yahya on, uh, virtually. Like, you did like a video chat. Yeah, it was chat, a year right? ago but now, still. but I just released it. But yeah, it, I mean, he was a great guy to talk to and just like, God. Damn, he's so built. Yeah, like the it's perfectly he's in Lovecraft sculpted. Country, yeah, yeah. And like, I feel like he's super naked in that show all the time. Yeah. And then like, she's also fucking gorgeous. She looks like a Disney princess. Mm-hmm. Just attractive people in this movie. Yeah, <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> um, so Anthony's back at the laundromat. Oh, really quick though, while we're talking while we're talking about Yahya, I love his. He has the perfect play on like you can tell he's like n- off for most of this movie he has a like lot this, of smiles yes laughs, he has yeah, he like, gets <laughs> these really creepy smiles where he looks really dead behind the eyes and i just think it's really good mm-hmm. anyway um we're back at the laundromat william now william tells the story of daniel robitaille aka our like this is candy man as we know him this is tony todd's candy man the painter falls in love with his subject who is um, uh, Virginia Matt, who's Helen, mm-hmm. um, or who, she ends up being Helen, right? Spiritually, yes, it was always you, Helen. Yeah, I, yeah. she's like the incarnation of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He also, uh, so yeah, uh, that's a good thing this movie does is it doesn't expect you to go see the original and it recaps the original without using any footage from the first film. I it, like that a lot. I like that. Yeah. I like that it recreates it with the puppet. I, I think I just think it's such a good visual that please continue to bring in these scenes. The and the end so credit good. scene is great because it is uh, this scene where William Burke says that like there are various candy men. Um, yeah, it says the whole damn hive. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not uh, who, it's the whole damn hive. And, you know, he mentions others like from the 50s who were killed when they tried to move to a white neighborhood mm-hmm. and stuff like that. So it's just a. Uh, uh, Black men in history being killed for being black men. Right. And uh, the end credits is the, like, puppet, like, shadow puppet show. iterations of each. Of each of them. The origin of each. No dialogue, just that wonderful score. And just, like, just thinking about it, I'm moved. I know. It's so fucking good. The end credits, honestly, like... It's it's just so effective. Yes. Yeah. It's really good. Yeah. Um. I I like this scene as the quote too, and when, when he's talking about how Daniel Robitaille was this paint this beloved painter, and the, the white people he painted loved his work, right? And they he says they love what we make, but not us. Yes. And isn't that 
the truth of <laughs> black art in general. Black culture. Music. TikTok. Yeah. T- <laughs> yeah yes. Right? Did you? Oh, God, this is such a, a <laughs> I think it was like a month ago, um, TikTok, uh, black creators on TikTok went on strike. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And, left basically white people on TikTok to, you know, they couldn't steal their choreography anymore mm. for all these songs. And like some of the stuff people tried doing is very good. But just you realize like how like it's we, that, we flounder that, without. It's that one uh, chick Jimmy Fallon had on his show. Exactly. Do, you know, like that's what this TikTok. movie is about. It really is, <laughs> yeah. And just the the concept of like, you know, music like mm-hmm. elvis elvis yep, and yep. he also says pain la- that lasts forever that's candy man and that candy man's how we deal with these things happening yeah he, because he says uh uh candy man is how we deal with the, yeah it's like kind of a denial he says something about it can't end like that uh that's that's a quote that i wrote down can't end like that and i think that it's an interesting idea of the lore of Candyman, the urban legend of Candyman being the spirit of these wronged black men being able to live on in some way and get revenge on people who have wronged them as uh, that is told as this community's way of dealing with it because like it can't end like that. Like that's so unjust for someone to be killed like that and that's the end of and that's the end of it there's no comeuppance and so i really like that idea of like that's why Candyman as a story exists just like the coping mechanism of how can such a wrong exist no he's got to be able to come back and get revenge right like there has to be something more to this person's story and just the fact that all of the various um iterations of Candyman are men who are ultimately made to be so helpless I think it's like, well, we're going to take their story and give them some agency. Like mm-hmm. they come back as this monster and they can, you know, exact revenge and kill and giving them some power to, you know, be able to fight in some respects instead of, you know, our, our lasting memory of these men being how they die. Because, yeah, he tells the story of how Daniel Robitaille is killed and it's fucking like awful. Hand he's, cut off. The hook Slathered it. Yeah. yeah hook put hook, in the hand. And then he's lit on, you know, stung and lit on fire. And then mm-hmm. finally he dies after being lit. It's like, yeah, I could totally like wanting to add an epilogue where it's like, and then he comes back as a scary monster. He's like, yeah. we got to give him some some agency so that our, our final image of him is not this one where he's basically being burnt alive. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So Brianna finds Anthony's new paintings of all the variations of Candyman. Which are fucking cool. They're very cool. I would kill to have one of those. I love they're gorgeous. They're yeah. very disturbing. And they're the last very... one is of Daniel Robitaille. Of Tony yeah, Todd, there's definitely a Tony so painting. Fucking good. I hope Tony has it. <laughs> That'd be great. Because they have to those paintings go somewhere. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, she finds those paintings and then he and comes he home. And he does a very bad job of trying to cover them. He up. like he he ha- he like kind of almost puts <laughs> canvases and then he just resorts to like putting his putting hands his, up. He's like no. Over these giant paintings just like no, 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 no. Please stop. No. It's it's <laughs> I love him in this. It's, um, it's kind of dumb. But yeah. then she's like, I'll show you Candyman's not real. Tries to say it in the mirror. He just starts breaking he mirrors. He breaks that mirror. Oops, that's bad luck also. That's also, oh, that's Brianna thinking her boyfriend time is. Time to go. Yep. Time. I mean, I, I love, again, smart horror movie character. A guy does oh. that and she's like, okay, I'm out. Goodbye. Like, don't come near me. Coming I'm done. i to get my shit with my brother. Yeah. Yep. I think what's what like this scene, especially because she's like, Candyman's not real, I'm real. And I think she kind of represents a character that's like, I don't even want, like, I don't even want to think about the past. Like, the past is the past. Candyman's not real, I'm real, I'm present. Let's focus on the now. We don't need to keep dwelling in tragedy. Which would make sense that she doesn't want to dwell on like her dad's exactly. suicide. Exactly. Yeah, 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 exactly. And so there's a brief scene with Brianna and Troy where Troy's like, hey, you maybe have this opportunity to do this stuff with this exhibitor in New York. Maybe we can do stuff with dad's paintings. And she's like, no, I don't want those anywhere in my house. Again, kind of connecting with of, her yep. denial of past and denial of, yeah, like Candyman's not real. I don't want dad's paintings in my house. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't want to be reminded of those things. 
And that's the last we hear of that plot, which is kind of frustrating. Uh, well, when she meets with the other exhibitor, the other curator who works in New York, uh, that other woman who they met at the dinner, she does mention like, oh, you could use your father's legacy. Oh, that's right. So she again, doesn't. it's the same thing as with Clive. Yeah. Only interestingly here, it's coming from a black, a black woman, woman as opposed to like, oh, it's all the white people in the movie well, that are. I think that's kind of, I mentioned earlier with Yaya, what happens yeah. with Yaya where he is compelled to use like, oh, I'm going to, you know what? I'll use Cabrini Green because I mm-hmm. was told my story is not as interesting. So I'm going to use this other tragedy to make art. And similarly, you have this this black exhibitor who I think understands her audience is white people very purposely. There's an exhibit right behind them of all these like white statues that are oh, kind of yeah. staring at them the whole time. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's like, that's why this, this black exhibitor who you think would be a bit more sympathetic to like, cool, I'm working with another black woman in this museum maybe, but it, it's it's more of the same. It's, it's like, use, use your father's use your, legacy, your interesting your, story. Yeah, your, your boyfriend who people got murdered in front of his exhibit that let's use that pain i believe she says people are buzzing about yeah his work. yeah, yeah. <laughs> people are bu- I was like oh, okay I, I it's fine i like yeah, i'll I like allow it, it. <laughs> um, but yeah i think yeah the the white colored statues in the background are just a reminder that this woman ultimately it this is what happens she is being made to prioritize like what's gonna sell to this white audience mm-hmm. right yeah uh but yeah with this scene with troy they're talking about Candyman, and Brianna's like, who would even do that? <laughs> yeah. Cut to that prep school yeah. where it's... Uh, uh, the girl who's at the exhibit yeah. and her friends. And her friends in the bathroom, and she's like, you ever hear Candyman? So they do it. Notably, the one... The one Asian girl runs. Runs away, like, and no. yeah, so leaving just like the four and white And there's also another it. girl in the bathroom who's black, mm-hmm. who's... She's like, like hiding in the stall, and because they're like bullying her, they definitely her. bully her. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, but then, yep, they get slaughtered. This scene feels very out of place. Yeah, it feels like it's from another draft. It, it sucks because it, it's yep. cool. It has one of my favorite shots in the whole movie. Oh yeah, in the mirror, and you see him just starting to float in. Yeah, because cool. the girl who's hiding in the stall, she sees a compact mirror mm-hmm. on the ground, and you see Candyman just barely kind of st- and he's his toes are kind of just dragging along the yeah. ground and it's very it creepy. cuts at the right time it's good but yeah. yeah the scene just feels like it was meant for the trailer almost yeah i know, have a whole like i kill count honestly i wrote it's cool but why con mm-hmm. maybe the contrast of white people very cavalierly invoking candy man compared to the fear that black characters have of him even though the black characters have basically just learned about Candyman, but they still like take it seriously. And I think this scene goes against the ending of the film. I, I also, I literally, I said, we already, we kind of already get the like Cavalier just invoking Candyman with the gallery owner. Is it to show the renewed spread of the legend? But then what's Burke's deal? Because this Candyman already seems to be doing just fine, killing He's random killing plenty of people. people. Yeah. So it's like, it just, I don't know why it's here. <laughs> yeah, because uh, before we get to the ending, there's one the the one scene where Anthony finds out from the doctors that he was actually born in Cabrini Green, yes. goes to visit his mom. Finally, it's Vanessa Williams, somehow looking better than she did in the first Candyman movie she 30 looks years amazing. ago. This woman is 59, I think we <laughs> looked up. Fuck? She looks fucking fantastic. She's Holy shit. Yeah. And does a phenomenal job in this scene. I'm very sad that we get the one scene with her. Yeah. But uh yeah, she, she reveals that he is in fact a little baby Anthony. I love that, the acting in this scene. She's so he, fucking she's good. so good. He seems genuinely heartbroken mm-hmm. cuz she has to restart her story a couple times because he just can't handle it. Mm-hmm. Um Yeah, that's v- really good. She says how she originally thought it was Helen who stole him like she did in the first movie we mm-hmm. saw, you know, when Helen woke up in her apartment with the decapitated dog and the baby gone. Yeah. And uh yeah. It's, yep, but no, Helen was Helen saved baby Anthony, and she's like, she handed you to me. Mm-hmm. And I, I wrote here, because I was thinking about this scene, because she also says, from that day on, we made basically, a pact yeah, to we never, to say, to never Candyman, say Candyman. But someone ended up saying it, But what happened? my take on this is, so I'll just read what I wrote. So I said, 
Did the residents purposely rewrite the story to make her the villain so that Candyman's name is erased and never said again? Oh, I do yeah. think that's true. I think that's true. So she she does say they all stop saying his name from then on. In that sense, Helen sacrifices her legacy to keep Candyman from haunting this community. But of course, that's not a permanent solution. The past will inevitably come back to haunt us. Anthony's inevitably going to return to Cabrini Green, like William says. And by repressing memory of Candyman and what was done to him, it doesn't fix anything. You're just just kicking the can farther down the road for future generations to grapple with. I think, and that relates to like Brianna's like, no, Candyman's not real. I'm real. She doesn't want to deal with the you know the past. She doesn't want to think about her dad really. You know his his art. It's it's very much just just broadly like you know by by suppressing and ignoring what's happened before, it will come back. Mm -hmm. Like it, like. William says is a perfect symmetry, right? Like it's always, you gotta deal with it. Like you have to eventually deal with that and be open about it. And in that way, you know, like that's why I think Helen is the white savior kind of works because even though she does make this sacrifice in legacy kind of unintentionally, but she does because she's now this urban legend villain, but that doesn't fix anything. Yeah. you know it. You know the role of a white savior like sure she she can do something good but systemically that's mm -hmm. not gonna cut it right yeah yeah so anthony returns to cabrini green and now we are going to hurdle towards the end we are sprinting through the ending um, yeah, he goes back to cabrini green and he sees flashes of light in a built in a yeah. door and he goes into it and then, then we cut to Brianna coming back to get her shit, and yep. this, she, this is when she realizes Anthony's at the laundromat because there's a pen. There's a pen that Burke gave him earlier. <laughs> Whatever. The pen is. I, I feel like the, I have lots of pens with stuff on them. Well, no, it's the pen. And earlier, when she found his paintings, he mentioned he Burke. Does, he does. And she was like, him. "Who's Burke? Yeah. My friend at the laundromat." So two and two together. Fair, fair. I think it, it's just enough for me. Yeah. Uh, so she goes to the laundromat, goes into the back room. Burke grabs her grabs her and yeah now we are in the end and you're like oh we're in the end yeah. and it's burke is an entirely different character now because what has been the plot so far we've been talking a lot about a lot of themes mm -hmm. and a lot of you know i think really great discussion this episode's already fucking long as shit sorry hon but what's the what's the movie the, the story like what's the, plot. the what's yeah. the story and it's like it's like Anthony learning, he just learned that, that he's he was baby. baby. He's baby. He's baby. Um, Candyman's been killing people. Ending time. It, it's it's pretty, It's it, yeah. This movie builds to a lot and then doesn't, it's very weird. And I like, I don't like how manic Burke is all of a sudden. Yeah. He is like, Manic. He's a little villainous then. I he's mean, almost not, like he's cackling not a bad villain. guy, but his ma he's very yeah, like his he seems like a totally different character. Yeah, just seems like a totally different character. Yeah, because yeah, he and, abducts Brianna. Yeah, and then we get a flashback oh, yeah. again to William's childhood of him seeing his, his sister, sister do Candyman in the the bathroom and then get killed by Candyman. Yeah, so his sister got killed by Candyman and. So I don't understand why, why he, wants he to... never brought this up mm -hmm. to Anthony because that seems like the bigger deal. Yeah, the like, ghost. <laughs> like the fact that the ghost is real and killed his sister. And it also feels like maybe this was the original cold opening that they still wanted to be able to keep some somehow. Maybe. It's weird. I don't like it. But I don't he, understand what the point of it is. When he takes Brianna, he's like, now we have a witness. And so she like wakes up yeah, tied, she's tied in a up. chair and he's like, he's calling the police saying, hey, uh, I have that guy who's been killing people. He's, he's got a hook hand. Yeah. So come get him. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then he hangs up and he's just like ranting. Villain mode. He's like, this area is stuck in a loop and it gets stained in the same spot over and over again. And this guy's giving it his all. Yeah. Like he, the performance is cool. It just doesn't. It, it's, it's weird. It's just a different it character. It comes out of nowhere. And he says, we need Candyman to defend us and kill them. And we'll use Candyman to protect this area from further destruction and whitewashing. Fair. I do like the concept, and it is a little bit meta, too, of 
like reclaiming Candyman, mm -hmm. using Candyman to tell a story through our eyes, because again, that original movie is white writer director and the whole like this movie's about gentrification so yep. maybe one way to keep those people out is to make them scared of the area and scared right. of candy man correct yep. but candy man's been killing people this whole movie yeah well, candy man again we just saw him kill a whole bathroom full of high school college prep whatever yeah, high students yeah 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 that like seem but probably pretty wealthy like, yeah so it's like they killed them they killed art exhibitors they killed art critics like he's, he's doing, doing great fine I don't know. It's, He's got a higher body count than Daniel Robitaille in the first one. I guess it's maybe just like a we want to have been the ones to create this Candyman. Do you know what I mean? Because all the other Candymans were made not by their own, you know, I guess. design. I also don't love how Anthony is just like he's not a character anymore yeah he's just uh glazed over yeah and i don't think there's a decent rationale for why he is this way yeah we switched to like now brianna's the main character yeah it's because because anthony yeah. is like he's it's almost like he's totally brainwashed or mesmerized because yeah, he his, chops off anthony's hand and yeah and anthony like offers his hand there, to him yeah. uh, for him to saw off and and his skin is now just covered in the bee sting nastiness like his whole body or it's like half his gross, body is yeah. real fucking gross the textures but he's bad. just sitting there glazed <laughs> over and yeah. i don't know why yeah well i'm saying uh so again a little bit meta where he's saying you can Make Candyman's story your own, but some things should be consistent. That's when he gives him the hook hand mm -hmm. and the jacket. And I'm like, okay, it feels like a bit of commentary on making their own version of the, the movie itself. Like, we're yeah. making our own Candyman, like, but we're going to keep some things consistent. So then he's going to basically kill Anthony via cop to make him Candyman. And mm -hmm. can I just, I like wrote a whole interpretation of this. Okay. So my interpretation, this is like, if this kind of shit's going to keep happening, why not use it to their own ends to defend themselves? And the idea of self-fulfilling prophecy, maybe, when you tell a population of people that they're inherently less than or criminal or doomed to fail, that has a real impact psychologically. And this is Burke saying, you don't get to tell us what we are anymore. We get to decide this ourselves. We're creating our own candy man. If you want to keep traumatizing us and creating incarnations of a monster. Don't be surprised though when that monster turns its eyes on you. And it just also reminded me of kind of reactions to last summer, like June 2020, where people are shocked at like, especially like police, pre like precincts getting burned down and stuff. And it's like considering all the generational trauma and just history in general, it's like, yeah. <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? It's like, if you don't want there to be a candy man out there that was created with the intent to kill you specifically, then don't let there be generations of candy man in the first place, or at the very least tell his story, say his name and prevent there from being future iterations of candy man. Um, that was my take on it. It's just like, fine, if you want to keep making candy mans, then we're going to make our own and use them to our own ends. You yeah. Know? If you're going to keep creating self-fulfilling prophecy where this cycle happens over and over again. We get to take our t our part in it and use it the way we see fit. That's kind of how I interpreted it, at least. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's, even though there is a Candyman running around currently, he's not one that was made with the intent of, you know, protect like self-protection and stuff. Yeah. But it still is confusing. It is confusing. And again, we watched this twice. Uh, the first time I realized halfway through the sending that I was lost, but, uh, yeah, we made it out. Uh, Brianna makes it out. She, yeah. After William goes, don't you want a sweet a little Pennywise? <laughs> yeah. She like cuts her way out of the chair, runs out. There's like a little chase scene with a bunch of like flashes and yes. jump scares. And then she eventually winds up above ground in one of the row houses, and he's there, and she fucking stabs the Stabbed shit the out of him. Fuck out of him again, like a smart <laughs> horror movie character. Anthony's like, I think he's dead. Yeah. Yeah, a little moment of humor when he now he's back, kind of to Anthony, or at least self-aware enough to have followed them out there and made a quip. Like, yeah, it's so weird. It's so weird. And then so he's like laying in her arms, and then the cops show up and shoot <sighs> Anthony and. I couldn't tell what was happening at first. Yeah, because the framing of it's weird. Because she's like, you know, she's in this room against the far wall, and Anthony is laying in her lap, and she's sitting there, and the cops like kick in the door, and immediately shoot, 
And I think it is an intentional misdirect that she kind of reacts and you're like, oh, did they shoot her? But no, it turns out they shot him dead, which like, one, logistically, how are they shooting a guy who's laying in her lap without, without shooting, shooting her. her? But then two, like, I understand uh, the intent behind this, especially because after this, one of the cops takes her into the police car and is like, so this guy was coming after us and right. we shot him, right? But like, why not make it, I don't want to say realistic as though th- this, this like, doesn't, yeah, because I'm as like, no, it doesn't this happen. definitely happens. But, and like some, you know, cops have death quotas often. Look up LAPD gangs if you want to get real depressed. But like, why not have him standing with it? Because he's got the hook. So it's like, oh, yes, he does have a weapon yeah. that they can lie he's and say he was coming there and right there. He was there. just so big and scary. But and... to, like, have him be laying there and have them, like, kick open the door and immediately shoot him dead, that just feels like it's just, like, too cartoonishly evil to me to, like, be effective. Yeah. And again, know? not to say that that doesn't happen because, like, it totally does. Yeah. But I think... In terms of just, like, being narratively satisfying. Yeah, just have him be standing there and have him, like, be walking towards Briab, like, will you please help me? And, like, raising his arms. Yeah, and have it be where you can see instant, like, ah, fuck, that's where this is going. Instead of, because I was just kind of confused the whole time. Yeah. Maybe you feel differently about this ending. And if you do, please, you know, leave comments. I'm hoping to read a lot of interesting takes. Yeah. Uh, So she gets put in the cop car. The cop's like, I'll give you two shitty options here. So... Then she's like, I'll say whatever you want if you let me look at myself in the mirror. And so we're like, oh, fuck. She's going to say Candyman. Again, I only hear her say it four times. She says it five times. I don't know I think know you she does. don't know how to count. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have a problem here. <laughs> Although he, you know what? No, I think he says it a fifth time. That's dude. what I'm saying. That's bullshit. Yeah. Hmm. What are the rules? What are the rules? So he then Candyman shows up and <laughs> just whips mercs righteous all these cops. ass. Yeah, we see him kill a lot of cops. <laughs> um, then we hear the "I am the writing on the walls" and it's really. And good. he's like walking around the cop car, and the reflection that we see in the window is the different Candyman. It's cool. Yeah, I like yeah, this. And which is cool. And this is, uh, I believe, this is Yahya's voice. But I think they're they're doing an it's effect to make it, yeah, way, modulate yeah. to make it like real deep and like Candyman. I thought it was Tony's so cool. voice. I know, at first Tony I thought says it was. that, you know, the dialogue from the original. And yeah, I don't know. but then, you know, I've talked to you. Yeah, we're kind of buds We're kind now, of friends, so yeah. I recognized it after a little bit of being like, oh, no. The dialogue from the original being here just made me like, oh, I love that original. Like, it just made me, because, again, I know you can't do the same thing. And like you said, I think. But it's it was, like that gothic, yeah, like, poetic. It's like so hazy and mm-hmm. dreamy and like really hot. Like that original movie's sexy. And because it's a Clive Barker story, man. Like, mm-hmm. I feel like if you're adapting Clive Barker, you got to be like a little horny. And like movies, <laughs> movies are not horny anymore. Like movies are very de-sexed. And like this, for this being a Candyman and for... Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, it's a very attractive. It's just like this movie is just not horny enough for me. I just, I don't know. I just feel like a Candyman movie should Man, be sexier. That's going to be the fucking pull quote, dude. Not horny enough for me. Chelsea Rebecca dead meat. <laughs> <laughs> Canceled for being too horny. Yeah, granted, like, this movie's doing its own thing. Mm-hmm. And we talked about that. I'm and glad I, it did. I'm glad it did, but like, I, it did make me like, ah. Uh, That's why the original is there, huh? I know, I know. Let's go watch that. I love Bee Swarm Face Candyman, where you can't tell what face it is. It's just like bees mm-hmm. around and then, a head. Then it forms into CGI Tony. Tony Todd. <laughs> I kind of wish they had just let him be older. I know he's a ghost. Yeah, and I like the idea of, of Candyman always has to stay the age he was. Because I think it reminds you that he was so young when he was killed. And yeah, it just kind of A life weird. cut short, you know? But yeah. I I think it would have been fine if they cut away for him talking. Because I think it's the when he talks it that worse, it yeah. looks weird. When, they, when he first shows up, I think everyone. it's okay. But they should have shown him and then cut away and you heard his voice while it's on Brianna. Mm-hmm. And that ends. That's yep. Candyman. And then, yeah. And then Kick the credits ass end credits. Fucking Stick sit there and watch it. If you don't, you're missing some it's very, real good shit. Very beautiful. And I yeah. think it's interesting that the credit sequence feels like looking at a little art gallery. Like it's this weird like oh, yeah. room. I wonder if that's more play on the, the three wall room kind of thing. Like you're you're looking in and observing something. Yeah. Yeah, good 
good, good shit. Like I just, it's it sucks when, and maybe this is more interesting this way. I don't know when the ideas are great. We've been talking about this movie for going on two hours. I have to edit this whole thing in a day. Sorry, <laughs> um, but the movie itself doesn't quite come together. Like it's, it bites off more than it can chew. Maybe I don't know. But. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. And another thing is, it's uh shorter than the original by almost ten minutes. I think mm-hmm. might have maybe could have used that extra time. Extra time. To maybe flesh out a few ideas. Or maybe. cut out the high school scene. Sure. Do something else there. Yeah, that again, that might have just been for the the slasher fanatics. More Vanessa E. Williams. Yeah. Uh, overall, you know, I think it's fine. Obviously, I I think it's miles ahead of those other two Candyman sequels. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, even though even though the second one isn't awful, it's got its own kind of like his, Bayou charm. Like great great whatever granddaughter. I think is. both the sequels have his very very white great great granddaughters yeah. who he then like max on it's weird it's so fucking weird yeah but that second one has uh uh who plays the Candy mom Man country uh the fucking little girl from the birds veronica cartwright yes yeah she's the mom which is cool the second one's not awful that third one is fucking trash mm. i don't even know if you watched the third one with me i think i, I did is that new orleans no that's the second that's one second what's yeah. the third one third one is like a direct to tv it's like I don't even remember the plot. I just know that the very blonde, very buxom lead character is always in a white tank top without a bra. I I think I remember. I, I think I was like half watching. Yeah, I don't remember the details because <laughs> yeah. it's such trash. But this is obviously way better than those. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's a well-made movie, uh, at least visually, like we've been saying. Like it, super yeah. well-directed. And... Regardless of our specific complaints with it, I'm so happy it did so well. Yo, same. Like, like horror has been carrying film through the pandemic, <laughs> honestly. And I know that a lot of people said that this movie was their favorite that they've seen all year, really important to them. Great. Like, I'm very happy for that. Yeah. It's boring if we all have the same opinions. For sure. Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm glad the movie exists. And I'm hoping in the spirit of this whole conversation that there are lots of comments with your own thoughts about it and uh, either pushback or, or enlightenment on some of the things we brought up. Because mm-hmm. I, I always like yeah, to be... Healthy, robust, uh, academic discussion, please. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be dicks. <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, you've got to edit this thing. Mm-hmm. And we'll see you guys next week when we speed edit this to get it out on time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in the meantime, you can follow Dead Me on social media at Dead Me James on Twitter and Instagram. And who knows, maybe sometime soon there will be a little TikTok added to that list. Ooh, who knows? We'll see. Maybe. Mm. I'm at Carebeck, C-A-R-E-V-E-C-C on Twitter and Instagram. <laughs> All right. So until next week, I'm Chelsea. And I'm James. And this has been the Dead Meat Podcast. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs>